While the rocky Pyrenees slope to the Bay of Biscay between France and Spain is a narrow mountainous land which has been inhabited since before recorded time by a people whose origin is unknown and whose language has no clear affinity with any other. Ethnologists claim the people who inhabit these hills and valleys, the Basques, to be the oldest homogeneous racial group in Europe, perhaps dating from the Stone Age. The little village of Navarnes is typical of the region. It has a population of perhaps a thousand and sits picturesquely atop a hill that is an island surrounded by farms. As in every Basque town, there is always a game of paloti in progress. This one against the church wall. As a rule, things are pretty quiet in Navernes, but this morning there is some news. A letter from America has arrived, and the postmistress, who obviously has already read it, spreads the word of its contents on her way to deliver it. While the origin of the Basques is a mystery, there is a legend that they are descended from Tubal, fifth son of Sapeth, who was the son of Noah. Tubal is supposed to have come to Europe before the building of the Tower of Babel, thousands of years before Christ. Tubal, the legend goes, gave his descendants, the Basques, the pure language of Eden, and the Basques speak it to this day. Because of their strongly independent character, the Basques are uniquely qualified to endure for long periods the lonely life of the shepherd. For years, they have been in great demand throughout the world as sheep herders. The letter from America is for this young man, Juan Gorespe. It is summoning him to America to herd sheep. Juan's brother, Roberto, hurries to deliver the letter for which Juan has been waiting impatiently. It is well known here that in America, Juan is paid well for herding sheep. The letter is from Juan's Uncle Jean, who lives in Grand Junction, Colorado, and it contains a check for $500. It explains that the United States Immigration Department has approved Juan's coming to Colorado to work for his uncle. Understandably excited, Juan tells Roberto to look after the sheep and hurries off to spread the news where it will have the most interest. He is going to tell his girl, Manuela. The property of Basques is always bequeathed to the eldest child, male or female. And since Juan is not the eldest child in his family, he is going to have to make it on his own. The job in America is his great opportunity. This is Manuela. While this bakery where she is employed is very primitive, it produces some of the world's best bread. Manuela's principal worry about Juan's going to America is that some rich and glamorous girl will latch on to him. She rubs him with flour as if to mark him for her own. Strong as the Basques are as a people, they have one outstanding weakness, and that is for festivals. They will throw a festival for any reason whatever, 
and Juan's impending departure for America is a good excuse. Any Basque festival has at least three ingredients, music, dancing, and wine. Basque dances always are traditional. Even the young Basques do not try to change the steps or the rhythms. Basque young people are also traditional when it comes to obeying their parents and revering them. Juan is getting a farewell word of advice from one of the parish priests. The priests of the Pyrenees are the leaders in every way among the Basques. The Padre is saying to Juan, now you just remember who you are, that you are Basque, and conduct yourself accordingly. Being a Basque means that you are honorable. See to it that you give your employer a good day's work for the wage he pays. Mind your manners and be faithful to Manuela. Write often to your parents and send something home when you can. The role of the Basque sheep herder in the United States has gone almost unrecorded. Yet without the Basque's capacity to endure solitude, the great era of Western sheep raising would not have been what it was. Thousands of Basques came to America before 1930. Not so many now, because sheep raising in America is on the decline. Most of them were young and strong like Juan, and were willing to work and suffer to become a part of America. Some, after making their stakes, went home to the Pyrenees to live out their lives. The young bartender is teasing Manuela about Juan's going away. He tells her that now she can give him some of her time, and kisses. Manuela takes it good-naturedly, but then lets him have it with a loaf of bread. Although the Basques live in seven provinces, four in Spain and three in France, they do not consider themselves either Spanish or French. Seven make one is their national motto, meaning they are a nation unto themselves. Stars shining brightly in soft evening skies None half so fair as my true love's eyes Sun smiling down with joy from above Brighter the stars on the face of my love By our con Dios, my darling Don't forget to come back to me why must I love As she watches the bus carry him away, the tears in Manuela's eyes give her double vision. She sees him going away, and she sees him returning, driving up the hill back to her. Pamplona is a vast stronghold and the capital of the province of Navarre, Spain. It is famous the world over for the running of the bulls through its streets at the annual festival in honor of San Fermin. All of his life, Juan had wanted to visit Pamplona and see the running of the bulls. And on his way to Madrid, from which he is to fly to the United States, he had the opportunity to do both. Bulls which run in Pamplona are bred in Andalusia, where the best bulls come from. Since Ernest Hemingway wrote about Pamplona's famous festival in his novel, The Sun Also Rises, millions of young romantics from all over the world descend on the town for a week every July. Not so much to honor the patron saint as to get plastered. During the festival, there is such a profusion of languages in the streets and cafes that Pamplona truly sounds like the Tower of Babel.
The streets through which the bulls run are boarded off, presumably to prevent accidents, and no one officially is supposed to get within them. But every year, hundreds of would-be matadors, some of them quite drunk, manage to evade the police and recklessly run with the bulls. As soon as the Pamplona police turn their backs, the daredevils scramble back into the forbidden streets. People pay well for the privilege of viewing the spectacle from balconies. This crowd is at the corral gate from which the bulls will burst when the cannon goes off at 7 o'clock. During festival week in Pamplona, there is hardly room to sit down. Every toehold has a toe in it, and every window ledge is occupied. These people are running ahead of the bulls, well ahead. The brave ones are further back, just ahead of the horns. The route the bulls run is through seven city blocks, and it leads to the city's bull ring. Running to the bull ring for the bulls is a little like hurrying to the cemetery. When they are released to roam the streets, the bulls are not at all sure what is expected of them. But the excitement and clamor of the crowd and the taunting of the would-be matadors arouses their defensive instincts, and they butt at anyone who gets in their way. First aid workers were kept busy hauling away the boys who zigged when they should have zagged. When they started sweeping the streets, Juan knew it was time for him to be on his way. <laughs> Why must you leave me, little white dove? The isles of Spain are cold above, colder than night. Everything is strange to him. He watches as the stewardesses prepare dinner and is fascinated that they actually cook the food aboard the plane. heart full of love. Why must you leave me, little white dove? In New York of an early Sunday morning, he is surprised that there is so little traffic. Why, he wrote to Manuela, there's not much more traffic on Fifth Avenue of an early Sunday morning than there is in Avenues. He wonders why anyone would care to live in New York where you are hemmed in on all sides and where there are no hills and there is no grass. By the time he makes his way to Times Square, the city has come to life and he thinks how like sheep people in cities are. Eventually, hunger got so strong in him that he put aside his shyness and managed enough English to get a hot dog and a Coke. It was the first time he had ever tasted sauerkraut and he did not like it. Men on horseback? New York must be a pretty backward town. Well, it's back to the airport and off to Colorado, where hopefully there will be some fresh air. From Denver, where he had to change planes, Juan takes a propeller-driven plane to Grand Junction. And for the first time, he sees the great mountains of the Continental Divide. Though he does not know it, they ought to be his home for many months during the next three years. Juan's employer, Gene Urity, arrives at the airport in the Welcome to Grand Junction car. It belongs to his friend, John Berkey, who uses it to greet VIPs. Gene is a Basque. He came to America in 1926, and his first job was herding sheep. He saved his money, accumulated some sheep of his own, and in time bought some land. He prospered. 
And that is the way mini Basques got their start in the United States. And today, like Jean, many of them are millionaires. Jean tells an acquaintance that he is here to meet his nephew, who is coming to herd sheep for him on a three-year contract. He doesn't speak English, Jean says, and I wouldn't want him to get lost. Jean recalls that when he came to Colorado in 1926, he came by train. It took him five days. He remembered he had an awful time getting something to eat because he could not speak English. And he remembered being afraid he would be scalped by Indians. Well, where is he? Could he have missed the plane? Must have. Maybe he got lost in Denver. Hey, Buster, this is where you get off. Terminado. Well, there you are, son. Welcome to Grand Junction. <laughs> what kind of a trip did you have? How'd you leave everybody back home? Gene, that everybody back home is fine, and they all send their best regards. Juan has brought some gifts for Gene, and child that he is, he can't wait to give them to him, right there in the airport. There is this bota from Pamplona, which of course Gene has to sample right then and there. Gene's been 40 years a sheep herder, and has never spilled a drop. And then there are some sheep bells, which Juan has brought for his lead sheep and his Judas goat. These are very important to a shepherd. And there is a bottle of Spanish brandy, which Jean won't sample here for fear of not being able to make it back to town. Before they go to Jean's upper ranch, where Juan will take up his duties, there are a couple of chores to be done in Grand Junction. Gene explains that Grand Junction is so named because it is where the Gunnison and the Colorado rivers converge. From here, he tells Juan, the waters run west to the Pacific. We are headed now for the First National Bank where Gene wants to make a deposit. Some time ago, they struck oil on Gene's Utah property and he has to deposit a royalty check. Gene tells Juan that the reason he has come to America is to make money. And this is where you should keep it. Here it will draw interest. What's interest? Juan asks. Their second stop is at an outfitting store. The Cordioid Bridges and Beret are all right in the Pyrenees, but that's no costume for a first class Western United States sheep herder. How are you? Very good. This nice to see you. Uh, my nephew here. Oh, yes. Glad He's, to see you. Uh, just got in from Spain. Well, that's wonderful. He's going to work. I want you to outfit him up. Uh, from the bottom up, everything. Oh, everything? Yeah. Pants, shirt, hat, boots. Everything. Whatever you got. Come About the 40, 42 size? You come with me. We'll yeah. fix you right up. All right. Would you like a white hat? No, no, negro. Negro. What? Black one, then. Black hat. Yeah. Black hat. Gee, Try it. See how it fits? Está bien. Well, that's good. That's very good. Número 42. Sí. Sí, amigo. Try on. Sí, como este para a ti, amigo. Está muy bien. Está muy bien. One thing more you need, Jean tells Juan and that is this hand to leather belt. Now, he says, you look like an honest-to-God American sheep herder. Jean and Juan are on their way to Jean's summer ranch. In the sheep business, as it is pursued in Colorado, you take the sheep into the high country during the summertime, and when the cold weather comes, you drive them to a warm climb down to the Utah desert, say. If you're successful enough, you have two ranches, one high up and one low down.
This country reminds Juan of home, the mountains and the greenery and the fresh air. There's the high ranch. There are about 100,000 acres in that one. Take a given acre or two, Gene tells Juan. When I first came here, there weren't any roads back up in this country. Up at the headwaters of the Cimarron River, half a dozen of the highest peaks in the United States rise in mighty splendor. And it is on their upper slopes that the finest sheep grasses grow. That's where you'll drive your herd to graze, Gene tells Juan. That's going to be part of your herd over there, those ewes with the newborn lambs. But we're not going to rush you. You'll have a few days to get acquainted, to get acclimated, and to get outfitted. The sheep will be his responsibility, and he must remain with them, day and night, day in and day out. It is obvious that to endure this kind of life, one must be physically and philosophically strong. And Jean hopes Juan is up to it. Gene remembers that when he first came here, almost 40 years ago, how displaced he felt, how lonely and what a yearning there was in him for home. This may not be the Ritz Hotel, Gene tells Juan, but it's comfortable. There's a shower outside, a pretty out back. Make yourself at home. Dinner will be ready for you and the other boys pretty quick. See you later. One thing about ranch life, the food is wholesome, and there is always plenty of it. Nobody living on a sheep ranch ever goes hungry. One eats lots of lamb, of course, and mutton. But best cooks are skillful in preparing the meat in a variety of ways. When he gets a chance, Juan tries to improve his knowledge of English. You speak, in, you speak, speak in English? Oh, me speak English very good. How do you say bastante in English? How do you say bastante in English? Bastante, bastante. Yo no sé. Usted no habla inglés. Shearing is a springtime activity, a specialized job. Shearing crews move through the sheep country, going from ranch to ranch, removing the wool. These ewes are being shooted into the shearing pens. Every shearer has his own pen of sheep from which he is separated by a burlap curtain. To procure a sheep for shearing, he simply reaches through the curtain and catches one by a leg. Perhaps simply was not the right word. Sometimes the critters are a little rambunctious. The shearing instrument is operated by electricity provided by a portable generator. Its blades have to be razor sharp. The wool has to come off with one sweep of the hand, and it must come off just at the skin. The shearer begins by clipping the wool from the sheep's belly. Shearers are paid by the head, so much per sheep sheared. Presently, the growing price is in the neighborhood of a dollar a head, of which the shearer gets about 50 cents. The other 50 cents goes to the shearing contractor who supplies the shearers, the transportation, the clipping equipment, the electricity, and the bags into which the wool is packed. Shearing is one sheep job Juan doesn't have to do. He watches the dusty operation with wry amusement, glad he's not a part of it. Once he has clipped the belly, the shearer will proceed to shear the legs before tying them together with a thong. Unfortunately, the price of wool is depressed. The wool of an average sheep weighs about 10 pounds and brings about a dollar and 80 cents. At such a low price, there is no profit in it for the sheep owner. And were it not for the lamb crop, he would go broke. Once the sheep has been shorn, she is shunted into an outside pen. Coming out of the dusty, dark pen into the bright sunshine, she is understandably a little dazed. Before the shearer reaches for another sheep to shear, he kicks the pelt he has removed out of the way. A helper ties it into a bundle and tosses it to the loft, from where it will be passed on to the baler. It used to be that wool was baled in great bags by men jumping up and down to compact it. 
That was always the job for the dumbest guy in the outfit, because it was the dirtiest. But now a machine is used which mercifully has made that stomping obsolete. Bailers, like shearers, are a breed unto themselves. He first places a burlap bag in the bailing machine. This mechanical stuffer had to be invented by one of the world's great humanitarians because it saves one whale of a lot of sweat and time. During the shearing season, the members of a shearing crew will make a lot of money, but the work is seasonal. The good pickings do not last long. And after the shearing season is over, perhaps the average shearer will spend a lot of his earnings in the nearest saloon. Then he will make do until shearing time comes around again. When filled, each bag will contain from 350 to 400 pounds of wool, enough to make a lot of beautiful carpet. One of the reasons wool is so cheap these days is that man has created many kinds of synthetic fibers which have replaced wool, and these synthetics can be produced more cheaply than wool. However, it is generally conceded that for certain uses, wool is superior to any other fiber. There is nothing that has its liveliness and endurance. Once the ewes in this herd have gotten over the shock of losing their locks, and once the necks have healed, they'll be considerably more comfortable. Then, by the time next winter rolls around, they'll have grown another fur coat. Their first concern, as with mothers of every ilk, is for their offspring. At such a mothering of time, there is more confusion than usual. The lambs have difficulty recognizing their mothers because their appearances have been so drastically changed. There is a great scampering around and baaing on all sides. How sheep can make any sense of such a babble is a mystery. But believe it or not, through the din, each mother can hear her own child's plaintive voice, and eventually the two will find each other. While he is getting his bearings and learning the ropes, Juan is assigned some chores. Many of the big sheep ranches today are owned by Basques, by men who came to America as herders. On these spreads, most of the men who work with the sheep are Basque, and Spanish is the working language. You can spend a week on a sheep ranch and you may not hear any English spoken. From time to time, Juan pauses to enjoy the scenery and to look beyond the mountains to home. None half so fair as my true love's eyes Sun smiling down with joy from above Brighter the stars on the face of my love Why must the sad waves make love to the shore? But Juan's main concern is getting his herd together for the trek up the mountain. Several bands are involved, a total of more than 2,000 sheep. They are in separate pastures, some quite distant, and these must be brought together. That's what Juan's doing now. In the process, he finds a bummer, that is, a lamb which does not have a mother. Either his mother died in childbirth or she had triplets and could only handle two. Anyway, Juan promptly adopts the little guy and names him Frankie. Juan has his choice of the available horses. He chooses the white one because sheep herders think white horses are lucky and because he has been told that pack mules, which will move his camp once they get above timberline, get along with white horses better than with horses of any other color. And for some inexplicable reason, it is true. Before Juan shoves off for the high country, Jean takes him into the old gold mining town of Telluride for a last look at civilization, if that's what Telluride is. The name of the saloon is appropriate, the last chance. But Juan probably doesn't get the irony of it. Chances are he doesn't know what the words mean.
As soon as the lambs are strong enough to travel, the herd is started on the long trek to the high country. The first few days, they will be moved slowly to give the lambs a chance to get used to herd travel. The young ones develop very quickly. After two or three months in the mountains, they'll come down fat and sassy. It is then that the male lambs will be sold for meat as spring lamb. The better females will be retained for breeding purposes. Periodically, as the sheep move out, the camp must be moved with them. The camp mover is expert at setting up and dismantling a camp. It is a routine he knows very well. In little time, he'll have the tent up and a fire in the stove. Nate Creek is at the 9,000 foot level. Not only do the lambs have to get used to the higher altitudes, so do Juan, his horse, and his dog. The Judas goat is a very valuable character in the world of sheep. For some reason, sheep look to goats for leadership. Every week, the foreman comes to count the sheep and see that none is missing. Counting sheep in an open meadow requires considerable concentration. It may seem impossible that Tom, the ranch foreman, could count them in this way with any accuracy. But he won't miss one. Gene, the boss, helps him. For centuries, the Basques have used the stick method of counting sheep. Each knot in the stick represents 100 sheep. If while counting, a man tries to keep the hundreds in his head, he'll get mixed up. Occasionally, a sheep will get lost. Coyotes will get one, or a wolf, or a bear, and occasionally one will be lost by accident, as when one falls off of a precipice and is killed. The bum Frankie does not get counted. He lives a privileged life. He is growing rapidly and learning his role as the camp nuisance. By now, he has come to look upon Juan as his mother, because Juan feeds him five times a day, condensed milk diluted with water. As a dispenser, he uses an old brandy bottle and a nipple made from the thumb of a rubber glove. Frankie's life is far different from the other lambs. He doesn't know he is a sheep, but probably thinks of himself as a person like Juan, or he may think he is a dog like Blackie. Blackie has no love for the little bum, but Frankie looks upon Blackie as a sister. Once he has the sheep grazed contentedly in a pasture, Juan sets about tending to his own needs. Few of the amenities of civilization are available to him. What he needs, of course, is a wife to do the cooking, keep the camp neat, wash his clothes. But having no wife, he must do these chores himself. While his is a simple life, it is not without its rewards, not the least of which is communing with nature. It would seem impossible to stay long in this magnificent area and not be spiritually enriched. While Juan must be on the lookout to protect the herd entrusted to him, he must also look out for his own safety. At this altitude, man has few enemies, but Juan's 30-30 rifle is always at hand. It is springtime, and the new grasses are sweet. Among those the horse is nibbling is the columbine, the state flower of Colorado. At the 10,000-foot level, skunk cabbage is common, but few creatures eat it. It gets its name from its fetid odor, but nature designed it to be beautiful. Aspen grows abundantly at this altitude. Slender, silver-sheathed trees with ever-shimmering leaves.
Basques have a high regard for physical strength, and upon arising, Juan does his daily dozen. He is building those muscles the better to impress Manuela, and he is never without this symbol of his religious faith. Frankie is the first to be fed because he is the most insistent. Before eating his own breakfast, Juan goes to check the sheep. Sheep stray even as children, and the old nursery rhyme, leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them, is not true. A wagging tail means the milk is flowing. Who has not heard of sheep herders bread? It is typically Basque. Juan bakes a big loaf every few days. First, he digs a hole to serve as an oven. Then he builds a fire in it. While the fire is burning down to hot coals, he prepares the dough. Salt, yeast, flour, and water go into the bread. These together with considerable elbow grease. The next step is to place the dough beside the stove so that it will rise. But man cannot live on bread alone. In the Pyrenees, Juan learned this method of catching fish by hand. It's quite a trick. On its way upstream, a trout will pause to rest. If you are quick enough, you can catch it and toss it onto the bank. The main course having been procured, Juan turns once more to the bread. The Dutch oven must be greased before the dough goes in, and the dough itself must be kneaded for the last time. Then the oven is placed in the hole and covered with hot coals. Jean cooks the trout, adding garlic and red pepper. Whenever the boss visits a sheep camp, he takes red pepper and garlic along and a lemon, just in case he's invited to a trout lunch. Juan has calculated it so that, as the fish are ready to eat, so is the bread. Juan makes a cross on the base of the bread, a traditional Basque religious gesture. It is like saying grace. Thank you, God, for this bread and all thy blessings. At this juncture, no self-respecting sheep herder would neglect the bota. <laughs> They are talking Basque, shooting the toro, which means bull. Jean is telling Juan about the time further up he killed a grizzly bear. Jean wants to know if bears are dangerous. Not always, Jean says. Like women and elephants, they're unpredictable. <laughs> Whereas Juan is a mother image to Frankie, he is a father image to Blackie. Blackie resents Frankie, figuring the little bummer should be with the other sheep. To sheep dogs, sheep are the lowliest creatures on the face of the earth, just below skunks. Every now and then, Juan, to keep peace in the family, plays with Blackie to show her he still holds her in affection. All right, it's time to go to work. Let's go see how the sheep are doing. Chimney Rock, which is almost 12,000 feet high, resembles a cathedral. Juan acknowledges its religious connotation. <laughs> Manuela loves him, 
She loves him not. She loves him. She loves him not. Three years is a long time. Ironically, when one is young and has little else but time. But just when he needs reassurance, Tom, the foreman, brings it to him. A letter from Manuela. Delighted though Juan is to get it, he will not stop to read it now. He will delay that pleasure until he has a moment of privacy. Meanwhile, he gives Tom the letter he has written to Manuela to post for him. Tom tells Juan that the camp tender will be coming with the mules to move him above Timberline. Because he is going above Timberline in the morning, Juan figures he had better take a bath today. It may be the last for some time. The good Lord knows that here the water is cold enough, but up above it will be all but freezing. The only audience for Juan's strip tease is Blackie. If there are two things a sheep hates worse than a coyote, they are soap and water. There's one more chore before the day is gone, and that's salting the herd. The tongues of sheep are not capable of licking salt from a block as cows are, so loose salt is used. Salting is done once a week, and it is always amusing to watch the lambs taste salt for the first time. They don't like it at first, but it has a fascination for them, and they soon come to appreciate it. It is to these high meadows above Timberline that the sheep will be driven. To the ewes who have been up here before, it is a pleasant prospect. They look forward to the rare atmosphere and to the sweet grass which grows in the higher elevations. It seems that in every sheep there is a little of the mountain goat. Beyond this sign is government property, the Uncompulgary National Forest. And beyond this point, the United States Department of Agriculture charges 50 cents a head for the right to graze its pasture lands. Because there are few roads of any kind above Timberline, Juan's camp is moved by mules, usually in the early morning. As the first rays of the sun come to herald the day in these high altitudes, it is cold, even in July. The mule is a marvelous animal one of nature's whimsies, a hybrid, the product of a male ass with a female horse. Mules cannot reproduce, and they have hardly any voice whatever. Nevertheless, mules have many fine qualities, the sobriety, the patience, the endurance, and the sure-footedness of the ass, and the vigor, the strength, and the courage of the horse. Mules are unparalleled for packing heavy weights at high altitudes. Whenever Juan's camp is moved, he is faced with the problem of Frankie. The little bum can't go with the herd because he will be hungry, and he can't follow along with Blackie the dog because he can't keep up. So Juan solves the problem in this way, contriving for the little fellow what might be described as a rumble seat. From this, Frankie gets an elevated perspective of the world he lives in. Quite rare for a sheep, which usually has his nose to the ground. Peculiar thing about a sheepdog, he is taught to go around the sheep at very close range, but not to bite them, just bark easy like. Cow dogs are just the opposite. They bite, but they don't bark. Juan sheep are herded into a government counting corral. Uncle Sam does not believe in counting in an open meadow. He believes mistakes can be made that way, 
and uncle wants to be sure he gets all the 50 cent pieces that are coming to him. Here you see Jean using the shepherd's crook. In ancient times and until recent years, no self-respecting sheep herder would have been without one. When he wanted to isolate a sheep or lamb for one reason or another, he would do it in this way. Now the crook isn't used so much. Where the hell is the Judas goat? To get the sheep started through the counting gate, it is sometimes necessary to drag one of the lead ewes through first. Once one sheep is outside the corral, the others will follow. In every herd, there are black sheep and some sheepmen like to have one black sheep for every 20 white to facilitate counting. It is a curious fact of nature that a white sheep will follow a black one. To the average person counting them, these sheep would look like this. But Tom sees them one at a time, and as before, every time he counts 100, he gives the boss the sign, and Jean makes a notch in the counting stick. From here upward, the progress of the herd will depend on the receding snows in the high country. As the snow melts and the drifts disappear, the grass springs up to greet the sun. The counting having been completed, the Department of Agriculture representative, range conservationist Harley Greenman, comes to get the tabulation. Tom gives him the figure, and the ranger gives Tom a permit for that many sheep. When Gene shows Harley the notched stick to prove the count, Harley shows him a mechanical counter he uses. What won't they think of next? Well, Gene still likes the stick better. It won't get out of whack. Eventually, the sheep will graze at 12 to 14,000 feet and even higher. They will remain in the upper meadows for about two months or until about the middle of September. Then when the first frost appears, they will start back down again. There is always the danger come September of being caught in a sudden snowstorm. One last drink from the boater before Juan takes off for the high meadows. Then it's good luck and God bless. Foreman Tom confers with the camp mover to establish precisely where the camp is to be set up. It is important that the foreman know the exact spot because in those inaccessible areas, it is easy to get lost. Nibble away, little lambs. Get fat and woolly on this high grass. The boss hopes your meat will bring 30 cents a pound or better, and your wool likewise. What you see here is nature at work, manufacturing wool to keep people warm and meat to feed them. But these sheep may be among the last to come here. The cost of getting them to these altitudes has so increased in recent years that it is becoming unprofitable. Yesterday, the camp mover brought Juan a puppy to train. As soon as baby sheepdogs are weaned, they are sent to the herders to learn the role for which they have been born. Juan not only will teach the dog the intricacies of herding sheep, he uses the puppy as an audience to teach himself the English language. You are dog. I mean 
eight, eight men. My name is Juan. Your name is Poco. My la lady name is Manuela. She is very beautiful. During the summer, Juan has matured. The isolation has had its effect. He has begun to form a philosophy. The mountains have had an influence on his character. Because mountains are strong and independent and indifferent to the puny problems of man, living among them, one is inclined to absorb these characteristics. Because they are invulnerable, Juan is becoming so. He who falls in love with mountains becomes a lover of solitude. Once he has lived alone in the high altitude with the clouds, the stars, and the sky, with the sound of birds and the blat of sheep, and the air scented with aromatic herbs, how is he ever going to be happy in a crowd? That is why sheep herders are men apart. While most of them eventually enter the mainstream of society, they have a hard time conforming to its codes. Juan takes cognizance of the threatening sky. Summer in the high Rockies is a short season, and his days here are numbered. In September, when the nights begin to grow chill and the first frost appears, the time comes for Juan and his herd to leave these higher climbs and start the long trek down the mountain. In a couple of days, the camp mover appears. It is his responsibility to see that the sheep get started down before the first snows fall. At daybreak then, Juan and the sheep start down the mountain, headed for the shipping corrals, leaving the camp mover to strike the camp. It will be several days before Juan and the sheep will reach an accessible highway. But once they do, big trucks will move the sheep to three destinations. Those lambs considered fat enough for market will be sold as spring lamb. Those lambs which require fattening will go to a feeding station. And the white-faced ewes, which are the best wool producers, will go to the winter range for breeding. Down they go. Another episode in the life cycle of sheep. One of the hazards of passing through the Midland Valleys is the possibility of running a collision course with a herd of cattle. Like oil and water, cattle and sheep don't mix. That is, cattlemen and sheepmen don't mix. It's a question of grass. Which herd is going to get it? The camp mover sets up camp in a grove near a water hole. He works alone because Juan, who normally would be helping him, is busy bedding down the sheep. At this time of year, when the sheep are on the march, the camp must be moved every day, and the camp mover has to hump his stumps because Juan's is not the only herd he has to service. To a mule, after a long haul under a heavy load, ecstasy is a roll on the good earth. As the camp mover is about to depart, he and Juan see a herd of cattle coming down the valley. The sight is disturbing. Juan knows there could be trouble, and he is particularly concerned when he sees one of his strays among the cattle. He goes off to retrieve it. Cattlemen consider themselves superior to sheepmen, and vice versa. We all seem to need somebody to look down upon. Because of their contempt for sheepmen, cattlemen have a more or less strong contempt for sheep. And some of them wouldn't be caught dead eating lamb. They tell the story of a cattleman who became very sick in his late years. His doctor recommended a strict diet of lamb chops. I would rather die than submit to mutton, said he. And so he died. Juan goes about his daily routine, teaching the puppy the ways of sheep, tending to his horse, taking his exercises, and dreaming about Manuela. He looks forward to a day off. Maybe there'll be a Basque picnic he can attend. 
The horse's shoes have taken an awful beating on the highland rocks, and after Juan gives him a manicure, the grateful beast says, Muchas gracias, senor, speaking Spanish, because that's the only language the horse knows. It is a funny thing about Basques. They all speak Spanish or French as well as their native Basque, but they talk Spanish to sheep and horses. That and a sprinkling of profanity. Juan exercises his horse every day. As a rule, they go looking for strays, or they go coyote hunting, or they just take a canter to nowhere. Uh-uh, looks like trouble. you think you're doing here? Look at your damn camp. Look at your sheep out there. You've been in here for three days. And you've even got damn goats over here. Vamos, get the hell out of here. Get your damn sheep and your cattle out of here. Me no sabe. No sabe hell, you bastard. I'll make you sabe. Get your damn calf and your sheep out of here. Bullshit. Not long ago, there would have been human blood shed over this incident, and perhaps a sheep and cattleman's war would have resulted. But today, that is not the way. There is a good chance the sheep killers will be made to pay for the animals they have destroyed. Perhaps man is making some progress after all. I went out to get revenge, Juan writes to Manuela, telling her his troubles. I was going to take an eye for an eye but I could not bring myself to kill the cows. We Basques are taught the Christian way is to turn the other cheek. Sheep are like people in several ways. One is they are always looking for a leader. As soon as they find a sheep bolder than themselves, they will follow him or her anywhere, even down into a hole. When that happens and sheep have followed the wrong guy, they have to take the consequences, just like people. Unlike sheep and most people, sheep herders are individualists. Like priests and other ascetics, they have the courage to go their own way, to stand on the bank and watch, rather than participate in the social swim. Compared to those who have a nine to five job, a sheep herder's way of life seems hard. And indeed, there is nothing cozy and secure about it. He has no dietetically prepared meals, no soft bed, no screen doors to keep out the flies and the mosquitoes, no secure roof, no television set, no companions, 
and no family or friends to ease the pain of loneliness. Therefore, his view of mankind and life is quite different from that of the vast majority of men. But because of his way of life, he is better able to cope with the practicalities of survival. He gets a chance to reflect, as few men do, and because of his love affair with nature, he seems to get more out of life than other men. The sheep reach the loading corral. It is here that the saddest episode in the cycle of sheep is enacted. And that takes place when all of the ewes are separated from their lambs. Many of the younger ewes have abandoned their babies by this time, but those with stronger maternal instincts still cling to theirs. It takes about four months to wean a lamb. When the baby gets too big and rough for its mother, she ups and kicks it out. And when the lamb can't get any more milk at the usual spigot, he starts living on grass. After all, grass is better than nothing. However, some mothers are so grieved at the loss of their offspring at this juncture that they won't eat for several days. This is the last we will see of our friend Frankie. Here he is put back into the herd. Now at last, he will find out what it is like to be a sheep. Sheep by nature are very docile, and a ewe is the most helpless of all four-footed creatures. She has been provided with no adequate means of defending herself or her lamb. Neither teeth, nor horns, nor heft. Nevertheless, she will struggle to her death to defend her child. To most people, sheep look alike but their faces and voices are as individualistic as humans. The trouble with identifying sheep so far as people are concerned is, they all dress alike. These male lambs of good weight are being shipped to market. Soon they will show up on the dining tables of the nation, one of the world's great foods. Their meat made rich and juicy by the high grasses of the Rockies. Basque picnics are traditional and unique. Almost any month, one of these colorful parties will take place somewhere in Colorado, Wyoming, Nevada, or California. And Basques from all over the West will flock to them. This one is in Reno, Nevada. The festivities invariably begin, as in the Pyrenees, at mid-morning with a religious service and continue through the day and well into the night. Sheep herders will travel many miles on foot or horseback to attend one of these get-togethers, and they will stay until the last bottle of wine has been drained. The Catholic religion has had an indelible influence on the Basque character. During the religious war within the Catholic Church, the Basques sided with Rome against the Huguenots, and the Roman Catholic Church dominates their lives today. Part of the congregation you see here is seated on logs. Besides acting as benches, the logs will be used in the wood chopping contest. Wood chopping is but one of several athletic events that come from the old country. The contestants use a special axe designed in the Pyrenees and made of the finest Swedish blue steel. The base or butt is heavy to give the razor sharp blade a strong thrust. Each of two contestants, and at other times there may be three or four, will hack his way through a number of logs. In this instance, six. The one who finishes first will win a money prize. The contestants chop barehanded, and their accuracy with the axe blade is something to behold. However, there is an old joke that the reason so many Basque men have only four toes on a foot is due to this sport. Meanwhile, in the mountains of Colorado, Juan practices his wood chopping in the hope of winning a prize at his next picnic. This young man, Esteban Sarata, has just won the wood chopping championship of Nevada. 
He took only 13 minutes to hack his way through all six of those logs. Weightlifting is another test indigenous to the Pyrenees. They are wrapping this young man in a corset to protect his clothing and to firm his belly muscles. The weight is a dead 305 pounds. Here is the champ. Easy as apple pie. And speaking of apple pie, the most important thing about any picnic is the food. These are lamb steaks, of course. Basque dishes, like their language, are singularly nationalistic at least in the way they are prepared. Lamb, and beans, and chicken, and sausage, all highly spiced and washed down with goodly amounts of wine. While wine and beer are very important to Basques and to Basque picnics, the Basque character precludes drinking to excess. In fact, Basques rarely overindulge in anything. They are a very conservative people. However, they love to sing and dance. There is a saying that where there is one Basque, there is a barret. Where there are two, there is a game of high ally. And where there are three, there is singing and dancing. Basque folk songs are inclined to be sad. And during luncheon, Louis Irigari, a noted Basque troubadour, entertains the picnickers singing a shepherd's song. The dark hills of space. Are cold above. Cold are the night winds, the long day is spent. Your place is here in my shepherd's head. Why must you leave a heart full of love? Why must you leave me, little white dove? Why must you leave me, little white dove? one of the traditional dances is called the La Huta. It is a spirited and exhausting exercise. The costumes have not changed in years. Red berets and crimson sashes for the men, black vests and red skirts for the women, and all in rope sandals. Everything indisputably basque. Their dances and folk music come out of their history. The best known Basque dance is that done with a wine glass. It is called the Gotelet dance. Here you see it being performed beautifully at the Reno Festival. Dancing for the Basques satisfies a physical need. It is a fine way for them to express their natural gaiety and fierce independence. They're very confident this year. Hey! Boom! Hey, that was beautifully 
There are four major events in each year of a sheep's life. The breeding, the lambing, the docking, and the shearing. In the Colorado area, the breeding takes place during the late fall so that the lambs will be born in the spring. Rams, which have been confined in bachelorhood for most of the year, will be released into a band of ewes, and the result is instant romance. You can distinguish the rams by their black faces and legs. The reason the breeding is confined to one period is so that the lambs will be born about the same time. Ewes are like the females of most species. They do not like the direct sexual approach. They want to be wooed a little. Rams, on the other hand, having been confined for almost a year in celibacy, are in no mood for preliminaries. Rams, like men, are competitive, and the older rams often treat young rams with high-handed contempt. Here, an older ram is trying to keep a young whippersnapper away from a ewe he has staked out for himself. One ram was put into this herd for every 80 ewes. After five days, they will be withdrawn for R and R, rest and recharging. The rams come in like a whirlwind for a fast month. Then that phase of a sheep's life is over for another year. Daybreak in the desert, early spring. It is the lambing season, and this alfalfa field is the obstetric ward. Every day is birthday, and babies are popping all over the place. As with the breeding, a lambing season lasts for about four weeks, and in that time, the sheep owner will know whether or not he will have a profitable year. Juan is out early to tend to the lambs which have been born during the night. Any number of dire things can happen to the helpless critters. Even eagles are enemies of newborn lambs. The herder can tell when a ewe is about to give birth because she will stop eating and will stay in one place. A ewe's labor closely resembles that of a woman's. The pains come at regular intervals and mount in severity until the baby is forced out. Meanwhile, other ewes, like anxious relatives, stand around sympathetically. We know what you're going through, honey, their expressions say. If the birth is natural, the herder may not give the ewe any assistance. But if it is a breech birth, he will hasten to help, because if he doesn't, the ewe may die. This ewe has had twins. In a good herd, more than 75% of the ewes will have twins, and some will have triplets. Once the babies are born, the mothers dry them in this fashion. Their eyes must become accustomed to the brightness of day, of course, and within the hour they've got to be able to stand on their wobbly legs and find their mother's udder. The first thing the herder does when twins are born is tie them together. That way they won't get separated and the mother can nurse them both at the same time. And that is the only way she will nurse them. She will see to it that they get equal shares. Lambs are born with many instincts, but the most powerful is to make a beeline for the milk depot. At first they have some difficulty finding the nipples, but they soon learn to go in from the side. Ewes are individuals. Like women, not all of them have the maternal instinct. The younger ones, lambing for the first time, may be the frivolous type. They don't want to be bothered with children. Use lamb for the first time at the age of two, and the young ones are notoriously poor mothers. If an old ewe has given birth to twins several times in succession, she takes it for granted that she should raise two lambs. 
Should she drop but a single lamb, she will be unhappy and may go out and kidnap another in order to keep up her record. Another peculiarity of ewes is that they are unusually proud when they give birth to a black lamb. At such times, they queen it over the other ewes. And when, as happens, a ewe gives birth to one black and one white lamb, she will utterly ignore the white one. With sheep, black is definitely more beautiful. After a week or ten days, the twins' hobbles are removed and they are free to go their separate ways. Forcing the orphans off on a childless ewe is one of the most interesting aspects of the sheep industry. Those poor little lambs that don't have a tit to suck must be taken care of. Whether their mothers die in childbirth or they be the third of triplets, it is up to the herder to find them foster mothers. Otherwise, they will surely die. Where do they get the mothers? Well, some lambs are still born and others die shortly after birth. In such cases, there are others full of milk which can feed an orphan or two. The way the deception works is, the skin of the dead lamb is removed in this fashion. Lambs are not much bigger than rabbits, and skinning them is no great trick. The skin of the dead lamb will be fitted to the orphan and used to fool the grieving mother. This is called jacketing. As a rule, a ewe will not accept a lamb that is not of her flesh and blood. So she has to be fooled into thinking that the bum is her baby. The coat peels off like a sweater. See how skinny this bum is? He's hungry too. The overcoat is a little too large for him, but like it or not, it is his meal ticket. The herder cuts a couple of holes in the jacket, puts a thong through, and secures it at the lamb's throat. It has to stay put for several days. The herder then puts the bum in with the bereaved mother. And sure enough, she is fooled into believing it is her child. She accepts it as her own. Here's another little bum that's been adopted. His masquerade costume is dried out. It's about time for it to go to the cleaners. About a month after the lambing season, the lambs' ears are notched, their tails are cut off, they are branded, and the males are castrated. This is called docking, and for the males, it is baptism by fire. Each owner will have a certain way of notching his lambs' ears, so if they wander, they can be identified. Brands wear off, but a notched ear is there forever. In docking, the female gets off easy. She suffers a naked ear and a shorter tail, but nobody fools around with her reproductive organs. The tails are severed with one quick flash of a sharp knife. The reasons for shortening the tail are two. One is for hygienic purposes. Long tails get dirty and a dirt attracts flies. Blowflies can kill sheep. The second reason is for appearance. Sheep just look better with short tails. For centuries, lambs have been castrated in this incredible way. The surgeon in this instance is Dominic Raker, a Basque American who, like Jean Urity, came to America from the Pyrenees many years ago. He is now a highly successful sheep owner. The gonads themselves are considered by sheep people to be an edible delicacy. They refer to them as prairie oysters, and among sheepmen, they are in great demand at docking time. Properly prepared, prairie oysters are delicious, and they're a great favorite with sheep herders. Here, Gene cooks up a batch for himself and Juan.
The testicles are in such great demand at docking time that there are seldom any left over. How are those, son? The oysters don't keep well, so it is a case of gobble them now when they are fresh, or step aside and let someone else have your share. At long last, the three-year period of exile comes to an end, and Juan is free to go home. He has fulfilled his contract and has served his employer well. In his hands, he holds the evidence of his past three years. He has saved almost all of his wages. Manuela writes that she still loves him. It is a joyous time and a time to reflect. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. What has been, has been. He sees the last three years of his life going up in flame. Adios, old partner. Take care of yourself and remember me kindly. As for you, Blackie, I wish I could take you with me. You've been a good friend. I'm mighty proud of your puppies. May they all grow up to be as fine sheepdogs as their mother. They are your responsibility now, amigo. Good luck. As Manuela envisioned when he went away, Juan comes driving back to Navarnes in an automobile. Oh, it's not his, it's a rented car. But it is bringing him home in style, as is befitting to a man who has seen so much of the world. Suddenly, almost unbelievably, the long, impossible wait is over, as if it had never been. Three years. Could it have been three years? Manuela can hardly contain her excitement. Juan, is it really you? wedding is forever. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death us do part. Tubagia bai zorionzu, nor dau esan eutzen. Bego zuen garrikoak eloturik eta kurtzuluak ezuen eskuetan amatabarik. Zenideok, Autor du iguzan gure pekatuak misterio santuak ospatzeko gai izan gaitezan. Autortzen da utzat, jainko guzti saltzuari, eta zuei bere bai nire zen ideoi, pekatu egin dodala gogapen hitz eta egitez, eta egin biharrak ez eginez. Bai, pekatari naz, dagikun otoitz. Bego zuen garrikoak eloturik eta kurtzuluak ezuen eskuetan amatabarik, Eta zeuek euren agusia este guetatik noiz bihurtuko dan zain gizonak dago zanez, etorritatea juiala berari igiriteko. Zorionzuak benetan ugazabak etortean, Marriage is the end and the fulfillment of life's first phase. It is also a beginning. Until marriage, a boy and a girl are concerned primarily with the body. After marriage, they are free to begin cultivating the spirit and anyone who has been married for any length of time knows that marriage is an introduction to responsibility. Manuela gets her ring on the right hand, and likewise does Juan. This is according to Basque tradition. Among the Basques, customs change very little, and today, as for centuries in the past, Basque wives and husbands wear their wedding rings on their right hands. Manuela and Juan are now joined by an invisible chain forever. 
What does the future hold for Manuela and Juan? They are setting out on a journey together that probably will be as undeviating as that which sheep take. For sheep, there is the inevitable breeding, lambing, docking, and shearing. And for Manuela and Juan, there is marriage and children and the struggle for food. Jean Urity was hopeful that Juan might choose to bring Manuela back to Colorado to live, but that is not to be. They have elected to remain in the Pyrenees. America is a fine place, Juan wrote to Jean, but the wages I earn there cannot buy the contentment I feel in my heart here in the land of my fathers.